Chapter Four, Cain and Abel. The man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, "I have produced a man with the help of the Lord." Next, she bore his brother Abel. Abel became a keeper of flocks, and Cain a tiller of the soil. Cain is the firstborn. He's the first human born with original sin. Adam and Eve were created sinless in the Garden of Eden, created with free will. They fell, and only then was Cain born, their firstborn. So Abel was a keeper of flocks. Cain a tiller of the soil. The soil won't yield its fruit as readily as it should have had Adam and Eve not sinned. So I think it's fitting that Cain is a tiller of the soil. Abel, on the other hand, is a keeper of flocks. So Abel here, a type of Christ, the ultimate good shepherd, and a type of Peter and the successors of Peter, the popes. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the soil, while Abel, for his part, brought one of the best firstlings of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not. Lip service is worthless. It's worse than worthless. It's damnable. This is the danger of being religious. We may find ourselves presenting offerings to God that aren't acceptable because they don't come from a true and sincere love of God. They come from other motives, which ultimately must, by definition, be selfish. If they're not godly, they're selfish. Those are the only two ways. There's the love of God unto contempt of self, or there's the love of self unto contempt of God. There is no third way. God is not fooled by the semblances of religiosity, of an outward piety. To the untrained eye, it's indistinguishable from his brother's true piety. Only God knows the heart. The only thing that God finds irresistible is humility, and Cain lacked humility. And the punishment of pride is pride. The punishment of not giving yourself completely to God is that you will not have given yourself completely to God. Cain greatly resented this and was crestfallen. So the Lord said to Cain, "Why are you so resentful and crestfallen? If you do well, you can hold up your head. But if not, sin is a demon lurking at the door. His urge is toward you." Yet you can be his master. Cain resented Abel, his brother. He resented God. He probably resented the soil from which he gathered the first fruits for his sacrilegious offering. He probably cursed the first fruits themselves and the birds chirping in the sky. This is the psychology of the unrepentant sinner. I'm not saying that Abel was not a sinner. I'm saying that Abel was a sinner who knew how to repent. He knew how to clean his heart and come to God with a clean heart and present offerings with a clean heart. So resentment is not appropriate here. What's appropriate here is repentance. What's appropriate here is the love of correction. Oh, I've gone astray. Thank you for correcting me, God. Thank you for correcting my pride and my hypocrisy. Thank you for pointing out to me that I have committed idolatry and adultery, because I haven't loved you first above all things, as I know I should. Thank you for the first fruits that you gave me to give to you, and now here are those same first fruits. And God would have smiled on him. But sin is lurking at the door, and when we leave our comfort zone. And our little bubble of delusion and false religion, he'll snatch us and rip us to shreds. So we need to be on guard, and obviously Cain was not on guard because he was so dumbfounded by his rejection that his reaction was resentment, not love and contrition, as it ought to have been. Cain said to his brother Abel, "Let us go out in the field." When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord asked Cain, "Where is your brother Abel?" He answered, "I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper?" The Lord then said, "What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil." Cain answers God's question with another question. This tactic of diversion will not work with God. 
the very blood of his brother Abel is crying out from the soil. Every sin we commit speaks. When we die and undergo judgment, we're going to hear the voice of our sins, each and every sin. Every careless word we utter will be judged. The little sins that are as dainty and light as a snowflake, they're so small, but the problem is that there's so many. And they're speaking. They're speaking now. Only we can't hear it. It's only at judgment that we'll hear the voices of our sin, whispering, speaking, or screaming, as in the case of certain sins like sodomy and abortion. So we should take care. We should, we should learn from Cain. That's why dark things are included in Scripture. It's not because religion is evil. It's because people are evil. God is holding up a mirror to us and saying, Look at yourself. Listen to yourself. Know yourself. We have to confront ourselves. We have to do an examination of conscience daily. If you don't know yourself, you can't go to heaven. You have to know yourself. Therefore, you shall be banned from the soil that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If you till the soil, it shall no longer give you its produce. You shall become a restless wanderer on the earth. The soil is already cursed, but here God is adding to that malediction because of Cain's enormous pride and his sin and his lack of repentance, his lack of contrition. His lack of humanity. Sin brings curses. Repentance brings blessing, happiness, life. We need to look at this story. We need to understand that it's a choice. We should choose wisely and choose life. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear, since you have now banished me from the soil, and I must avoid your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth. Anyone may kill me at sight. What we see in Cain's complaint is a lack of faith, a lack of trust in God's goodness, a lack of trust in God's mercy, and a denigration of God's perfect justice. Our punishment is not too great for us to bear. That's a lie. We see here how the lies of Satan flow naturally into the heart of the unrepentant sinner. What comes to mind for me is Judas, when he betrayed our Lord, he could have repented. He knew that he was wrong. He knew that he made a mistake. I like to think there's a chance that he did repent and that he, he's in heaven, but the overwhelming opinion of the saints is that Judas is damned and he's in hell. We can't know that for certain. But he could have repented. This is what we need to learn when we look at people like Cain and Judas. He could have. He had the possibility. He was given the grace of free will. That's what our free will is for. It's to choose God, always. To repent when we've sinned. Judas knew he made a mistake. He could have repented. He needed to humble himself. Note the paranoid mindset of Cain. There is no rest in the world for those who don't have rest in their heart, who don't have peace because they haven't repented, they haven't confronted themselves and been honest with themselves. They're insane. They've unbalanced themselves. They're disordered. And Cain is no different. He's the first example of this, someone whose mind is racked with paranoid fantasies, persecution complex. He pictures everyone as an enemy, everyone as a potential threat. Everyone's out to get him. Not so, the Lord said to him. If anyone kills Cain, Cain shall be avenged sevenfold. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone should kill him at sight. Cain then left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Justice is a real thing. The apparent lack of justice here below is temporary. It's passing. It's fleeting. We don't need to concern ourselves with vengeance. God will take care of Cain. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So 
The spirit of vengeance, which is a sinful, disordered vengeance, a hateful vengeance, that is forbidden by true religion. That's forbidden by God. Of course, we need to fight against injustice, but in a healthy, sane, holy way, with righteousness. So there's a sevenfold punishment to anyone that would avenge the death of Abel by killing Cain. Descendants of Cain and Seth Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Cain also became the founder of a city, which he named after his son, Enoch. St. Augustine talks about the two cities, the city of man and the city of God. I don't think it's coincidence that we see the first city in Scripture being attributed to an unrepentant sinner. He is hunkering down for battle against his enemies, his perceived enemies. Cain's perceived enemy is his neighbor. It's his friend. It's his first lieutenant among his thugs. His perceived enemy is everyone. It's God Almighty. It's the saints. It's the church. Cain's perceived enemy is probably even in the mirror when he looks at his tattooed face and he doesn't recognize the twisted features. He's confused. He's lost. Because when he had the chance to repent, he didn't. He was proud. It's a very chilling story. And we have to understand that that city that he built is thriving today. We're to be in the world, but not of the world, precisely because of Cain's city. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mahujael. Mahujael became the father of Methusael, and Methusael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took two wives. The name of the first was Adar, and the name of the second, Zillah. Adar gave birth to Jabal, the ancestor of all who dwell in tents and keep cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the ancestor of all who played the lyre and the pipe. Zillah, on her part, gave birth to Tubalcain, the ancestor of all who forge instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubalcain was Naama. Lamech took for himself more than one wife, so this was contrary to God's law at that time. Later there was a dispensation given to the holy men, the patriarchs, to have more than one wife. And I think St. Augustine said that when it was the custom, it was not sin. But it was not the custom when Lamech did it. And Lamech is placed clearly and unambiguously in the lineage of Cain. So there's an atmosphere here of disapproval. The genealogy goes on to talk about the artisans, those who work with precious metals, those that form instruments of music. And we can admire, on the one hand, the skill of the craftsmanship, of the ingenuity. But the irony is that they don't practice the art of true religion, which is the only art that matters. So this city is thriving. The city of Cain is exciting. I think it's very alluring when we live on the surface, the flashing lights and the sexy women. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but unfortunately it doesn't stay in Vegas. The sin of Vegas is everywhere. Sin City is everywhere. Where does the pilgrim find shelter in this world? Where can we go and not offend God by participating in the flesh, and the worldly ways of Cain and his city? When I picture the city of Cain, I don't picture mud huts, I picture skyscrapers, well-dressed CEOs, firm handshake, friendly smile, clean white teeth, power, money, success which are all good in and of themselves. It's good to have clean teeth. It's good to have a firm handshake and a good work ethic, to get up early and to work. That's good. But only God knows what motivates that. And these people that populate the city of Satan, these people are working harder for death 
than I am for life. This is what Thomas Akempis says in The Imitation of Christ. It's shameful because it's true. Those who pursue evil are very diligent in their work. They are motivated. They're self-sacrificing. There's almost nothing they won't do to achieve their ends. We can be tempted to join them because appearances are very deceptive. In our day-to-day -day lives, when we meet the person of Cain, if we have the spiritual wherewithal, the self-awareness, the alertness, the vigilance to recognize the mark of Cain, and to recognize that this is Cain, we have to immediately go back to his unrepentant, hateful sin. All the distractions, his shiny shoes and his expensive watch, that allow him to move through this world safely. All of those are distractions from the essential point, which is that he did not repent. He was not contrite. He blamed Abel, he blamed God, he blamed everything but himself. So he's an enemy. He's an enemy to himself, first and foremost, because he's an enemy to God and to neighbor. And so he's our enemy too. We have to love Cain, but we need to be aware and to beware of Cain, the danger that he poses. Because he's not moving through this world the same way that we are called to move as pilgrims through this changeable world. He's here to stay. This is his home. If you want to think about it this way, we're guests in Cain's home. We're unwanted guests. Maybe it's better to say that we're trespassers on Cain's earth. Maybe it's better to say that we are poachers of Cain's game, his ill-gotten game. And when we come and we try to take one of his flock and bring them into the flock of Jesus Christ, you better believe that his enmity will show itself. Cain will hunt down his lost sheep. And unlike Jesus Christ, he is not love incarnate. Cain is hatred. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Listen to my utterance. I have killed a man for wounding me, a boy for bruising me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. The city of Cain is thriving. Lamech comes along, and we see not a lessening or a moderation of Cain's wrath and anger and pride. We see an augmentation. If Cain was avenged seven times, Lamech will be avenged seventy times seven times. When Peter asked Jesus in the Gospel, how many times should he forgive those who offend him and who ask for forgiveness? Jesus said, seventy times seven times. So Jesus is giving us a remedy, and he's showing us the way. Adam again had relations with his wife, and she gave birth to a son whom she called Seth. God has granted me more offspring in place of Abel, she said, because Cain slew him. To Seth, in turn, a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Now we have the introduction of the city of God, because Abel is dead, but he's been replaced the name Seth, I think, means replacement or substitute. So here we have a sort of resurrection of Abel. Abel was a type of Christ, and Seth is a type of Christ. And they are the spiritual parents of all of us who are striving to belong to the city of God. And they are the ancestors of Jesus Christ. At that time, men began to invoke the Lord by name. We know that Cain and Abel offered sacrifice to God, the first fruits of the soil, the firstlings of the flock. But now, with the birth of Seth and the city of God, there's a renewed or an elevated liturgy. The primitive form of worship is replaced 
by a growing body of rites, symbols, and rituals. Cain City is growing. They're growing in the arts. They're building their trumpets and their fanfare and their armies and their fortifications. And the city established by Seth will also grow. And we see the first indication of that growth in the liturgy. The delicate musical instruments and the fine clothing are certainly part of the liturgy, or they certainly will be eventually. But they're not mentioned here. What's mentioned is the name of the Lord, people calling with their voice. We come into the world naked, we'll go out of the world naked, but we'll have a voice to call on the name of the Lord, even if we don't have a tongue, even if we don't have vocal cords, we can call on the name of the Lord. Even if our brother Cain kills us, our voice will call out to God from the soil. This is what we have as followers of Christ. We have a voice. The enemy has might. We have right. When Revelation talks about the great dragon, Satan, falling from heaven and taking one-third of the stars with him as his tail sweeps the heavens, one-third of the angels fell with Satan. There's a two-to-one ratio here. We have the upper hand. If God is for us, who can be against us? Cain, with his cities, with his instruments of torture and destruction, and warfare, his control of the media, art, theater, and literature. We have the upper hand. We have Seth and Abel. And so a third have fallen, but two-thirds of the angels did not fall. God is unity. Satan seeks division. So they are disabled. Because they're disordered, they're disabled. Because they handicap their hearts and minds, they're handicapped. The godless children of Cain are lame, spiritually. They're blind. They're deaf. They're dumb. So we have the upper hand. We'll have to suffer. Our reward is not here. Our reward is in heaven. We're pilgrims. Between the perfect paradise in the Garden of Eden and heaven, lies the city of Cain. As we pass through, we try to bring as many with us as we can. I said earlier that Cain seeks diligently after his lost sheep, but not as diligently as the Good Shepherd seeks his lost sheep. The city of God has the advantage there, too. It's just more difficult to perceive. We're operating on a spiritual level. When Jesus was arrested and St. Peter impulsively sliced the ear off the soldier, Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Do you not know that if I wanted to engage in a physical battle, I have more than 12 legions at my beck and call, legions of angels? And later he would say, my kingdom is not of this world. Christ allowed himself to be persecuted, despised, tortured, and killed by the city of man, by Cain. And until the very end he was mocked. He was able to save others. Why can't he save himself? If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. Come down off the cross. This is an example to us of how we engage in the world and what we're up against. People will be asking us, why don't you save yourself? Why don't you come down off your cross? Come down off the cross. You're suffering needlessly. Life is here and now. Come down off your cross. This is the constant message bombarding those who would follow Christ. Come down off your cross. We don't want to see you suffering. Come and join us. That child's inconvenient, just kill it. 
Your parents are inconveniencing you? Just kill them. You're doing them a favor. Take them off their cross. They're suffering needlessly. Put an end to it. We have clinical methods that are prompt, cost-effective, and painless. We have the answers. Technology has the answers. Science has the answers. Join us. You're invited to come down off the cross. And they invited Jesus down off the cross. But he toughed it out to the end. His prayer needs to be our prayer. Before his passion, he prayed twice. If it's possible, let this chalice pass from me. But not my will be done. Your will be done, Heavenly Father. So climb back up on the cross. If you've come down, it's not too late. Climb back up. The way to climb back up the cross is to crawl hands and knees and lay face down at the foot of the cross. And Jesus, in his mercy, will look down on your humility and bring you with him on his cross. He'll give you all the crosses you need to make it to heaven.